Um, interestingly, AI thinks that there were healing properties of natural springs in the area around Harsbury. I've never seen them. I don't know where they got them. Maybe because new hilltop owners are planning to put a spa in their hotel. <laughs> um, it also said the hotel would have been a prominent landmark in town during John Brown's time. Well, we know that can't be true because he was there. Anybody know when John Brown was ready to happen? 1859, right. Yeah. Well before the hilltop was built. And uh, then they said that the hotel closed in the 1970s, and you know that's not true. <laughs> so the thing is that you also can't believe a lot of things that, that um, humans have written, and this is where some of the AI-generated material comes from. Um, there's a lot of myths out there. Uh, a lot of efforts at, um, oh, sorry, yes, sir. Yeah, miss, uh, can you give us an idea where a lot of the houses look at the other people here may know I've been to Harper Square four times and I can count. Sure. I don't know exactly where the Hilltop House is. So um, most people, when they visit Harper Square, they're in the lower town area near the rivers, right? Yes. Uh, if you go on up the hill, that's um, High Street, it becomes Washington Street, and you take a left on Columbia, and then a right on Ridge Street, and it's on the peak uh, of the, the hill overlooking the rivers. And I'll show you some pictures of the hotel in a little bit, okay? Does that help? Yes. Great. Uh, okay, so um, anyway, there have been people like looking at some old newspaper articles, maybe just some here and there, discrete bits of information, and then they, there's been some big jumps to conclusions based on incomplete information. And then the other thing that has happened is that there's been a lot of trusting and then repeating over and over information that, that was really an unsourced claims, and especially those of a notorious self-promoter who we'll talk about a little bit later. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to hit a few of the myths, but we're also going to talk about some information that's just been ignored and not really talked about at all. And being that this is uh, Women's History Month, we're going to start with the woman, the Lavinia Holloway. Uh, Thomas Lovett married up. That's my first, first fascinating find. <clears throat> and I'm going to take a picture in. So Lavinia Holloway has an amazing story. She was born in North Carolina on a plantation in 1855, and someone we don't know who, when she was five years old in 1860, brought her north to Boston uh, by herself, evidently. Um, she was believed to have had a white father, which was not uncommon in those days uh, for the um, slave women to bear children from, from their white enslavers. Um, she was brought to Boston, and the person who brought her died very soon after. So she's left all alone in this big city. And a man named Henry Ingersoll Bowditch, who was a um, very well-known physician and abolitionist, took her under his wing. He was good friends with the abolitionist poet John Greenleaf Whittier, who you may have heard of. And Mr. Whittier was friends with a woman named Elizabeth Hale Smith, who lived in Dover, New Hampshire. Now, Elizabeth Hale Smith was the daughter of William Hale, who had been a former senator from New Hampshire. He had served two terms. He was a very wealthy ship owner. She married Jeremiah Smith, who was a former governor of New Hampshire, and then became a judge. He was, um, he had passed away this time, by this time he was much older than her, so she was widowed and had a son and, was, and had moved out to the country to Lee, it's about 10 miles outside of Dover, and was living in her family home up out there. And she took Lavinia into her home as a small child and raised her as a member of the family. She sent Lavinia to their little one-room schoolhouse, the, the white schoolhouse in, in Lee, um, she was probably the only child of color. Um, there were very few others in that area at that time. Then she was sent on to a private high school, a white high school. She did a semester at Salem Normal School in Massachusetts, came back and taught in the white school in Lee. And then um, Mrs. Smith wanted her 
to go to the South and teach people of her own race. So that's how she gets um, in West Virginia. To, she gets, passes through Harper's Ferry at Stora College, and then they send her to Woodstock, Virginia. And she taught school there in a black school for about a year, didn't like it at all. I'm sure it was a very different environment than she was used to up in New Hampshire. So she decides to try something else. And But if, while she was in Harper's Ferry, she met Thomas Lovett. Kind of, um, I don't know if someone was playing a matchmaker or if it was by accident, but she went on a hike and he was their tour guide taking them on the hike. But she didn't, nothing happened that's so significant that she wanted to stay in Harper's Ferry then. So she goes to Boston and enters um, the nursing program at New England Women's and Children's Hospital. She's the second African-American woman to ever graduate from a skilled nursing program in the country. So um, she graduates from school. She works as a private nurse up north, and she and Tom had been communicating via letters during this period. And um, when Mrs. Smith died in 1882 and left her an inheritance, she married Tom Lovett and they moved back to Harbors Ferry. So you can imagine with her background why she would be a very valuable asset to the hospitality business serving white guests. Okay, here's a surprising one. Tom Lovett was arrested just before the Hilltop opened. So, um, in, I mentioned before that in 1888, they bought some property and they started building their, their hilltop house, the new hilltop house. So, if you read articles from around this time, they call it the new hilltop house, and that's because there was an existing hilltop house already. And um, <clears throat> they, uh, they had, obviously, this model of a house. They called it the hilltop house. They didn't call it the hilltop hotel. And I'll show you a picture of the original house in a little bit. But they're, they get into, they were, sorry, planning to open the hotel in early June of 1890. And they have all their, you know, equipment and supplies ordered, their training, their, their staff. And they have, um, they had gotten a construction loan. We're not sure exactly from where, but then I'm going to tell you about the people who provided them the loan then in May that covered the construction. Um, right at the end of May, Thomas is arrested. Now, there had been evidently a, a gang of thieves in the area that they were found, finally rounded up, and um, one of them fingered Tom Lovett as receiving some of that stolen property. And he was arrested and um, went on trial. And despite the fact that a number of Harper's Ferry's leading white citizens testified on his behalf, the jury found him guilty. Well, the newspaper you know, puts out this article, you know, the white newspaper saying, we can't believe this happened. How could, they, how could they find him guilty when all of our best white citizens spoke in his favor? And we're sure he's innocent. We just can't believe he did this. So his attorneys appealed the decision. The judge says, Sorry, he's guilty. He spent a night in jail and paid court costs and then went home and opened his hotel and uh, just went on with things. And we never heard or hear about that again. Um, it's a very curious thing. I don't know if maybe there were some people who objected to him opening the hotel and someone was trying to you know, throw some barriers out there to him opening it. But nevertheless, it didn't work because he had such an outstanding reputation in the community. I think that really made a difference because people just knew he was not the kind of guy who was going to break the law. All right, so this surprises some people, and there, there's a lot, um, if you're reading on the internet, you will find um, these beautiful stories about how this was a place where, even though this is in the 1890s and uh, it's a world where Jim Crow is getting worse and worse, segregation is a huge problem, People will say, but at the hilltop, there were black and white people staying together. And that's just not true. Um, the closest thing where that was happening was at on the Store College campus. But even there, um, so the Lockwood House, the Brackett House, 
And then they had some other dormitories where they were keeping people. They kept spreading and opening more houses because business was really good in the summers. Uh, one, one dorm kept black people. That was Lincoln Hall. All the other dorms were whites only. So even if they cross paths out on the grounds of the campus, they were not staying in the same building. And they were definitely um, not segregated, I'm sorry, not integrated at the Hilltop House. There are multiple sources that says he keeps all the best white people there. This is a hotel for white people. And then in 1896, when Store College decides not to keep Lincoln Hall open anymore for black guests, there's this huge outcry from their alumni because there's nowhere else for the black vacationers to stay. So very clearly, this is what was going on there. There was an all black staff and their musicians were black. And obviously the management was black, but all the guests were white. And the only exception might be um, if the Lovitz invited some friends over to stay in their apartments in the hotel. Right. The Hilltop House was financed from beginning to end with help from former Confederates and locals from former slaveholding families. <clears throat> this is a big surprise, too. Uh, a lot of people thought, oh, maybe there was some family money. Maybe Tom's parents kicked in some money for the hotel. But what we have um, in the, the records at the clerk's office is a deed of trust from five men who were mostly Democrats, who at that time, I don't know if you remember, but Lincoln was a Republican, and many black people voted Republican out of their appreciation for Lincoln for emancipation. And the Democrats were more pro-slavery and more pro-Confederate. But there were five men um, from leading families in Jefferson County, which was a pretty strongly Confederate county, that provided the, the money for the hotel. So the hotel cost, um, the newspaper says as they're building it, that it's between three and three thousand and four thousand dollars to build it. And in May of 1890, right before they opened up, these five men came through with a thirty-five hundred dollar loan to the Lovitz. There was one particular family who um, I'm going to leave unnamed, but he was a former Confederate soldier. His wife was the sister of a Confederate who had been executed as a spy during the Civil War. They stuck with the Lovitz until the very end. So with all these numbers, this isn't all of them, these are all the various loans uh, at the bottom here um, that they loaned to the Lovitz over the years. Even when the husband passed away in 1905, the wife kept loaning them more money, more money. When they expanded, <coughs> more money. When the hotel burned down, she loaned them money. When it burned down a second time, she loaned them more money. And by 1926, their debt was $66,000, which is about $1.2 in today's dollars. And that's actually what happened in 1926. Uh, she died in 1923, and um, her estate called in the loan. They basically sold the loan to somebody for like 50 cents on the dollar, and, and that person called it in and bought them out in 1926. Okay, so here's um, another, this was a, falls into the myth category. Some of the famous guest claims at the hotel, I'm going to say are highly questionable, <laughs> and I'll be polite about that. So um, in 1956, Five, a man named Dixie Killam bought the Hilltop Hotel. So the Lovett sold in 1926. The next owners owned it until 1939. Uh, they, these folks owned it for a few years, and there were two other owners. And then in 55, Dixie Killam bought the hotel. Dixie Killam is that um, infamous self-promoter that I mentioned <laughs> earlier. <laughs> He was well known for, um, he did good things, not saying that he didn't do good things. He kept the hotel going, that's for sure. He brought it back to life because in the early 50s, the hotel had been closed for a while. Things were so bad in Harpers Ferry before the National Park got going. But he, he got in on that 
like the slide up when the national park started operating and growing and um, bought that hotel, brought it back to life. But he started promoting, so if you see the first one in 57, a favorite inn of President Woodrow Wilson and the celebrated Mark Twain. In 1958, it shifts a little. It's a favorite retreat of, United, of uh, five United States presidents and the celebrated Mark Twain. And then in 1959, they uh, fed information to the New York Times. You know, it's a hotel once frequented by Mark Twain, a president or two, and other celebrities. Um, even today, if you see any list of people who have stayed at the Hilltop, you'll always see Mark Twain on there. <laughs> so uh, to our knowledge, he was not there. He, um, he did live in D.C., but before the Hilltop was built, and he very rarely came back this way anymore um, later in life. Um, I, I think there are like websites of people who, who know where he was almost every day of his adult life, and there's no evidence that he was ever in Harpers Ferry. There's no newspaper accounts that he was in Harpers Ferry. In 1978, the park interviewed the Lovett's daughter, uh, Charlotte Lovett, and asked her specifically if she remembers Mark Twain being there. She says, nope. And he, they said, Samuel Clements? said, nope. <laughs> um, and they said, well, how would you know if he was there? And she said, we didn't recognize his bushy hair. <laughs> so, um, and the fact that the Lovets did not ever mention him, and the next owners, you know, all through the 30s and 40s, never mentioned him, um, makes us think that this is something, I don't know where this idea came from. I don't. I'm not going to say he just totally made it up. Maybe he saw something in a guest book that made him think that Mark Twain or Samuel Clemens was there. But this is where it started. Now, there were some famous people, for sure, that stayed at the Hilltop. President Woodrow Wilson came in 1915, came for a lunch when he was um, dating Elizabeth Galt, or Edith Galt, excuse me. And they came back again the next spring and had dinner at the Hilltop. I think it's a stretch to say it was a favorite retreat of Wilson because he never spent the night there. He was just there those two times. And then many of his cabinet members came at various times after that. Vincent Astor, he was the son of John Jacob Astor, who went down with the Titanic and was a very wealthy man, maybe the wealthiest person that stayed at the Hilltop. He, he definitely was there. Pearl S. Buck, who was a, a West Virginia-born author, um, she wrote The Good Earth. I think that's her most famous book. She was there in 1970. Um, Alexander Graham Bell is another name that you'll see on a lot of the lists of people who stayed at the Hilltop. We cannot find any evidence that he was ever in Harper's Ferry. Twain, probably not. Carl Sandburg was there in the 1920s sometime. He actually wrote a poem that talks about the Hilltop. So that's pretty good evidence that he was there. So I thought I would share with also um, some fascinating artifacts that we found. Um, this first one here is a dance card from the Easter dance in April 1901. And it turns out that the current mayor of Harpers Ferry, his wife, um, is the granddaughter or great-great-granddaughter of the woman who owned this, this dance card. And she shared it with me. And also, so it's Clara Towns. Um, there's an invitation to the Thanksgiving dance that she also got. She had several other ones, but these dances were held at the Hilltop House all the time. And you can see why not only was the Hilltop bringing money into the community, but they were also inviting the community into the Hilltop for all these um, special occasions. And I think that, that probably the town really enjoyed that. Lots of people who, who were talking about their childhood growing up at Harper's Ferry will talk about going to the hilltop and we would dance, we love to dance. <laughs> so um, the picture there of the hilltop, um, it's not dated. I think it may be from the 30s or 40s, but it's a pretty rare picture that we found from around that time. And then the, uh, the postcard I think is kind of fun. So this is dated 1918, West Virginia, started prohibition long before the rest of the country did. I think 1914 is when it took effect. 
And so somebody on the other side is a hilltop postcard. But on this side it says fine air, fine treatment, fine eating, fine drinking, whiskey, 350 a quart in Cumberland. Let's bootleg. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think actually the hilltop ever served alcohol, by the way. Um, there was a very strong temperance movement in Harpers Ferry Store College where you know Tom went to school, was very strongly, you know, pro-abstinence and um, and then eventually, you know, West Virginia went dry anyway. So they missed out on a lot of extra revenue by not being able to sell alcohol, but it doesn't look like they did. And there's actually a telegram in 1909, I think, that Tom Lovett sent to his state senator um, supporting prohibition in the state because they it took several years before it actually passed, but they had started as early as 1909. Okay, so here's some pictures. <clears throat> so the first one is the Hilltop House. That's the original Hilltop House in 1890. And then by 1899, they expanded by building on the second building there to the right. Um, so you can kind of see if you want to know where the Hilltop was. If you're down in Lower Town looking up on that knoll, uh, that's, it was very prominent. You could see it from Across the river, if you are up on Maryland Heights, you could see it. Pretty much all over town, you could see it from Lower Town and on the, around the rivers. Now, keep in mind, this is the hotel that they knew from 1890 to 1912, so that's 22 years. That was the hilltop. So, most of the time they were running the hilltop, that's the space they had. 1912, the house, the hilltop house burned to the ground. And um, this is the hotel they built. They hired architects, very well-known architects from Clarksburg, West Virginia, and who had just finished building Harpers Ferry High School, by the way. And um, beautiful, elegant hotel building. I think this was probably their pride and joy. Unfortunately, it only lasted until 1919, and then it burned to the ground. 1920, this is a hotel they built back. You can see that it's shorter, much less elegant, built quickly, built on a budget. They were only there five years and then they sold it. So this was probably not their favorite version. This was not where their heart was, was in that version of the hotel. This was, let's build it back quick and cheap so we have a business. So they finally, like I said, when they, um, the debt was called in in 1925, they signed the deed in 1926. They, they got their personal property out of the place and that's about it. They were 70 years old at that point, so you know it's time to retire. Their daughters had both moved to Brooklyn, New York, so there was nobody to pass on the hotel to. And so they sold the hotel and they moved up to Brooklyn and lived with one of their daughters. The one daughter that married, he, he got the whole family in the deal. And they lived there with them for the rest of their lives. Thomas died in 1940. He was actually visiting Harper's Ferry when he died. And, um, and then Lavinia died four years later up in Brooklyn with her girls. All right, I will show you. Oh. This is what I want to show you what happened after the hotel was sold. So over there in the top um, right corner is the 1920 version. And you can see that a lot of changes happen over the 20th century. So in this black and white photo, you can see they stuccoed the top floors. Uh, they added dormers so they could put some more hotel rooms up on the third floor. Uh, on this side of that, um, left side of the hotel they they had these really ugly additions i mean there was like no appreciation for aesthetics in some of these additions and of course inside the hotel they carved up rooms they you know would combine two rooms together so they could have more bathrooms in each room because it not originally not every room had its own private bathroom they carved up spaces on the main floor so that they could you know, rearrange the dining and the kitchen area. 
you can tell maybe in this black and white picture that that um, on the very far right, the, the restaurant, you know, that's kind of out over the river overlook is different from what it was before that had been rebuilt. They, the report from the structural engineers in 2018 says that they went underneath where there was only a crawl space under the hotel and dug that out so that they could put in mechanicals, more modern mechanicals, which destabilized the foundation because the dirt that was under the house was holding up the foundation under the, the hotel. And so it was destabilized because of that. And you know, they would cut through beams to put pipes and electric through. And it was it was not in good shape by you know the 2000, 2008, um, when new owners bought the hotel, they originally had planned to restore the hotel, but um, they had professional engineers who told them that just it's not worth it, it's not savable. And so unfortunately, in November of, uh, or fall 1922, they deconstructed the hotel. They kept all the stones, they're in pallets, they're numbered, they studied what was there. They found um, on the uh, river side of the hotel, they found beams that were charred from the previous fire that had been reused. Um, but now, now it's empty up there, and they're going to build a new hotel in the style of this um, 1913 version. And um, here's their concept of what they want to build. I don't work for them, so I can't tell you much about what's actually going to happen next or when it's going to happen, but that's what they show us. That's their place. All right. Now, I'm sure you have some questions, and I'm happy to try to answer some of them. Yes, ma'am. So are they shifting the whole structure? I mean, there's no structure anymore. I guess they demolished it. I've yes. been up to the ruins uh, several times. But um, are they moving? Are they moving the, um, the dwelling to be a little bit further down the street? Um, I, you know, it, the back end of it may be further down than um, the, the old one was, but I think that it's basically the same area of the property that the old hotel was on. It's just, it's, it is definitely bigger than the old hotel. The, oh, sorry. I don't know if you were. Oh, I was uh, wondering, could, do, you, do you know about the recent controversies, the opposition to the redevelopment, which I think the West Virginia legislature actually changed the law on uh, who gets to control zoning uh, because of the concern about the local opposition. Do you, do you do, we is know. That, is that in the book? <laughs> we well. do know about it. Uh, we've lived it uh, for a few years. We've been in Harpers Ferry for seven years, my husband, Christian, and I, and I uh, have a bed of breakfast in Mr. Saunders' house. But um, yes, what eventually happened because the controversy had been dragging on for so long, the West Virginia legislature created what they call a tourism development district and set specific parameters that they could, there could be five such things in our state. Uh, right now there's only one and it's in Harpers Ferry and the state is in control of what happens within that district and um, they are right now working on the hotel's permits. They've submitted their plans to the state and they're waiting for the permits back from the state. As they're reconstructing um, and you said they put the different uh, pieces of the building in different pallets. Have they found any kind of um, artifacts from, say, uh, when the Indians roamed that area, or um, you know, or even all the way back to prehistoric ages? Are they doing that kind of? Work? I have not heard of anything like that being found. I mean, they definitely found a few hotel artifacts, but I haven't heard of anything from that far back. Yes, sir. Yeah, right across the street from there, there was like an annex to the original hotel. Probably a mid 19th century building. The last time I saw it, it was still there. Are there any plans to tear that down and renovate it or do anything? So there was a house, a little cottage built in about 1914 or 15, a little stone cottage. And um, that was there in that. 
the two-story annex building was built on. It was attached to that little cottage. So, and I'm not sure exactly, I think mid-century is about right, maybe even a little later than that. They have since torn down the two-story later addition, and the little cottage remains, and they're going to definitely restore that cottage. Yes. How do all the laundry houses so, so they did um, they did buy those properties as well and they are planning eventually to rehabilitate those and use them for guest houses um, but their main focus as I understand it is going to be getting the hotel built before they get to work on those yes um, I have a question a couple of questions first of all when did Thomas Lovell die Thomas Lovett died in 1940. 1940. Yes. Um, and also, you referred to dorms as opposed, so there was a college up there? On so the Store College was established in 1867 to educate the newly free black people, mm -hmm. and um, it lasted until 1955. So the, the there were four houses that actually belonged to, there was an armory in Harpers Ferry, there were four houses up on Camp Hill along Fillmore Street that were the, the residences for some of their officers. And when the Civil War ended, the government decided not to, to rebuild the, ar ar excuse me, the armory. And um, so they donated those four large houses to Store College, and that became the core of their campus. Okay, because you, so the, uh, the students, were the ones that were working the hotel? Some students did work over there in the summertime. Um, I, there's also an interesting comment by their daughter Charlotte in that interview I mentioned where she says they would go down to Richmond every year and get people to work for them. So I'm not sure why Richmond because they were very, um, this is in the book too, but they were very connected in Washington DC and I'm not sure why they didn't just go to DC because it was much closer. But for some reason, Richmond was a good source of workers for them. Yes, ma'am. Uh, if the Lovitz owned the business, why was it whites only? So I think that they wanted to make the most money possible from this hotel. So they would definitely have a much larger population of people with disposable income to spend on, I mean, the people would come at this time, would come and spend weeks and months, the whole summer in the hotel. And there weren't as many black people with that kind of income and that kind of flexibility with their time to stay um, in resorts like that. Because um, I'm saying that because even Lincoln Hall, which did permit black vacationers, had a really hard time making a profit. Yes. Yeah, is there a projection for a modern hotel like that, how it would change the economic dynamics of Harper's Ferry itself? And is that one of the issues that's ongoing with how it's going to be completed and when it's going to be completed? Um, I, you know, I probably can't speak with a, very much authority on that question, but they've definitely <clears> done <throat> economic um, projections, and I think that it will, but there'll be a lot a lot more taxes being paid to the town of Harpers Ferry when the hotel, even when it's under construction. Um, I, I can't speak for the people who oppose the hotel. I don't really understand it totally. Um, so I'm not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. Even uh, at this point, to get to the uh, National Park, we have to park up on the Hill Across uh, Route, uh, what was that? Route 9. Uh, 340. 340 and take the, uh, the bus uh, down to the, to the mm -hmm. historical site. So with this hotel here, it looks like it's going to accommodate quite a few tourists who want to drive their cars. Uh, is the uh, infrastructure around the hotel, do you know, is that going to be upgraded? Or is it going to be a real pain in the neck for those of us who just <laughs> <visit, laughs> casually? Um, again, I don't know what the current plans are that they have. I know that they were working on a, a garage with some underground parking. That I'm sure it's not enough to accommodate all the guests, and I think they'll have some off-site parking with the shuttle. Yes, ma'am. Now, right now, the big thing is 
Yes, they signed a, a legal contract, a conservation easement that they had to leave open um, an overview of the rivers, actually two of them, 24-7 once the hotel is built. Right now it's a construction site and it's all closed off, but once the hotel is built, they are required by contract to do that. That I can't say. <laughs> You'll be lucky if there is. Yes, sir. So it's under corporate ownership. Yes. Yes, that's true. A, a group of investors. Called Swan? Swan Investors, yes. And how big is the property? Do you know an acreage? I do not. Do you guys know? But it includes other houses? Yes, so it includes where the hotel will be, it includes that cottage where the annex was, and it includes the four little, um, the four armory houses uh, along Washington Street, and um, part of Columbia Street going up to the hotel is included in the Tourism Development District. How many people are you to do Christian, do you remember? I, I, the last, <laughs> this room count has changed a, a lot. The last I heard, it's around 122 rooms. Uh, the hotel, when it closed, mm -hmm. I believe, I, I was told again, that's even controversial, it was around 80. It was not making a profit. And it was, <laughs> it was at this eight rooms. Eight. 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 <laughs> so they're looking at one, 120 or so. Um, but it was going to be a lot larger, and then they brought it back. I think it was going to be 145 or something like that, and they brought it back down. But they have to have a certain number of rooms to make this economically viable. We do not want to see this hotel close until you know, later. It's got to make money. And there are going to be food facilities there as well. Right? Oh, Absolutely. Yes. That's yes. really important to our town. Mm -hmm. food. <laughs> yes. Nora, have you been able to find photos of the rest of the family or just the men? Um, oh, I have a picture of one of their daughters. I cannot find a picture of his wife. Um, a lot of the information I found out about Lavinia was from folks up in Lee, New Hampshire at their historical society because Mrs. Hale Smith was such a prominent figure. They also knew about Lavinia, and so she's included in, in a couple of books that are written about that area and uh, I spoke with the authors of one of those and she's like I was so hoping that you would find a photo because we can't find one. I know that they existed at one time but I don't know what happened to them. Can I say one thing? Huh? I just want to say one thing. I was involved in the negotiations for this tourist development district and we had uh, 17 meetings, 142 uh, hours of meetings so between the town and the Hope and the Swan people. I mean, and, and we negotiated hard with them to get a fair agreement for our town and for West Virginia. And it wasn't like they pushed us over or anything like that. It was a very back and forth kind of thing. Um, and I, I happen to be a pro top guy and I just really feel it's important for our community. It's been there since 1890. We need to have a new hotel. Do you think this is Yeah, that's, they added one more floor to this to give it, to make it a little bigger. But um, um, we've met the family, the Schoenfelds, who are really behind this. And it's not the Marriott Corporation or the Hilltop, I mean, not the Hilltop, the Hilton or something like that. This is like people you can meet, and they're they're good people. They, I trust them. Yeah, and you meant this is one floor higher than the That's original hotel. That's one floor hotel. higher. Not, one, not one more than this. Yeah. Right. Oh my gosh, if they know what's good for them, they will. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Ma'am, sorry. Do you know if they're going to? Is it going to be just strictly sleeping rooms or restaurant, or is there going to be conference room space? Yeah, there will be conference conference room yeah, space. Yeah, the size, maybe. Well, the problem they have they have to make this hotel uh, economically viable. They keep making it smaller, and we've lost more and more uh, of those meeting rooms, the meeting rooms. 
um, the real money is in the hotel rooms and the restaurants. There's going to be, I believe, two restaurants, a spa. Um, it, it, it's a luxury place. There's no question. Did I, did I remember correctly? You believe there's going to be 122 sleeping rooms? Correct. Because that cannot support a very large conference of any size. Correct. Yeah. No, yeah. We just don't have the room for parking of uh, uh, large, large groups. Is the population of Harper's Ferry still about 300? No, 263, I believe. 263. Yeah, it's quite small. But Bolivar's attached. They're over a thousand. Okay, so yeah, we two towns are really close. People. And they're really pro built up. <laughs> okay, Kathy. He was arrested and was guilty by Yes. Yes. That was his sentence. Yes. Um, I think it's interesting that we don't know what the argument uh, his attorneys made to the judge was. Uh, I don't know if they were trying to argue that the jury was prejudiced, but for some reason the judge was willing to uphold the the uh, the charge, right? But but only give him a minimum sentence. So there must have been something funky going on there. Mm -hmm. Yes? You know, I've heard the story of the train station really played a very important part in the hotel. Is, is that expected to project into the future that a lot of people come there by train? They're hoping yeah. that they're hoping. Yeah. Meaning they won't be the call. Correct. Yeah. You don't want to open. Yeah, and that will probably depend on the, um, if the state of West Virginia pays their contribution to the um, the Mark train line, the, Mark train. <laughs> the Maryland commuter train. <laughs> Any more Lovett questions? You had said that he spent a couple of years in Rhode Island. Yes, I know that's your favorite topic. So, all right, I'm going to reveal one more secret. Um, we. When we were, I was looking at the census in 1880, I noticed that most of Tom's siblings, except the ones who had married, were still living with their parents. But Tom Lovett was not in Harper's Ferry anywhere. So I had to do a much broader search, and I discovered him in Providence, Rhode Island, and he was working as a coachman for a very wealthy businessman named Louis Downs uh, there in Providence. And he spent two years living with him and driving his coach for him, which I wish I knew so much more about that. But uh, I, I don't know if he was there kind of like learning about the life of the rich and wealthy people um, of Providence. Um, certainly in the Gilded Age, being a coachman was like the least demeaning service position. You know, you got the nice uniform, you were out there in the public all the time. Uh, you had to be very well trained, like facial expressions. A lot of coachmen were very good looking because they were the most visible servant and the rich people wanted people to, you know, be impressed by how good looking their coachman was. I actually read an article that uh, up in New York City, uh, it became a thing that, that rich people's daughters were running off with the coachman. <laughs> so good looks. I don't think that happened with Thomas, but... Um, and also there was a, a gentleman named um, Downing, uh, George T. Downing, who owned, he was a black man who had owned a, a white hotel in Newport, Rhode Island uh, since the 1850s. It was called the Seagirt. And, you know, perhaps he, this gentleman was like entering retirement at this point in 1880, but Thomas may have heard of him and maybe I don't know if he met him, but at least maybe got some hope that maybe he could be successful running a nice white hotel. Yes. Are there letters of Thomas to anybody or the letters to Lavinia or are there any guest registers? So sadly, um, so Thomas had Thomas and Lavinia had two daughters, Florence and Charlotte. Florence married but did not have children. Charlotte never married. Charlotte lived the longest. She died in 1979, and we don't know what happened to any of her stuff after that, um, unfortunately. So probably whatever letters or papers and the photos that we'd love to see um, disappeared at the time she died. 
And so the only thing we have is an application packet when the two girls were going to go to school up in New England at Northfield Seminary. They, um, Northfield Seminary still exists today, and they still have an application packet for the Lovett girls. And so there were several letters of recommendation, plus letters from Thomas and Lavinia to the school. And that's the most personal information we have. And, uh, and also the registers, if they exist, we don't know where they are. How many man hours, woman hours, sorry, it's a street. How many woman hours do you have in the research of all this? It sounds like you went to different <laughs> states. <laughs> I, I couldn't say. I did have help. Like I said, I had um, Kathy and a couple of other gentlemen who have um, been helping me with the research part of it. I've been doing all the writing, but they've been great. With, uh, especially one of them lives over in the D.C. area, so if I need research from over there, he's been great to, to go look it up for me. But um, I've been working on it a little over a year, year and a half maybe. And I'm very close to being done, but that doesn't mean the book is going to be available very soon because there's you know a long process of editing and you know laying out the, the design of the book and uh, all of that other stuff creating indexes so I'm hoping like maybe within a year so, okay one more question uh, just interesting I seem to think I recall uh, having dinner at the Hilltop house I think it was with, with my first wife many years ago. When was the most recent closing? Of that? Of I believe what, they, what, what, approximately what time? Yeah. Was it 1970? Was it 1980? Was it 1950? I'm, I'm just going out. So it was still open until 2007 when the current investors purchased the hotel. As a matter of fact, they had been visitors to the hotel themselves and loved it. And, um, and then in 2008 is when they had to close it. This was in, in the 1980s, probably. Okay. Uh, but it was, in a, it was becoming a uh, state of disrepair at that time, and maybe it had some renovations. Something, but I don't know. I was just trying to get my mind around when yeah. I was there. I, can't. I know that in 1998, um, so the next owner after Dixie Killam, he sold it in 1987 to Mr. Stanhagen, and Stanhagen got a grant from the state of West Virginia in 1998 to do some updates and renovations. I don't know if he had to close it during that period or if he was able to keep it open, but um, yeah, I've heard stories about uneven floors and doors sagging and you know, lots of things like that going on, cracks and plaster. I saw one person say they, they got into their room late at night and um, they didn't realize how bad the room was until the next morning, but they had an awesome view out the window, so they just put up it. <laughs> yes. Oh, we have fam. I, I live on Maryland Heights, and we had family weddings, and the guests would stay at Hilltop House. And the latest I can think of was 98. Okay. And people thought it was funky and charming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that interesting combination of funky and charming. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This